welcome to Rule of Thirds, an offshoot of our Screen Refresh podcast. Our goal every episode is to take a little break from watching and analyzing movies, dive headfirst in some nostalgia, or just get a little creative. So every month we create a different topic and create a top list that may or may not be near and dear to each of our hearts. Shoot us a message on Instagram, Twitter, slash X, slash Facebook, at Screen Refresh, or send an email at screenrefresh at gmail.com. Let us know what your top three are or suggest future topics. I'm your host, Tim, and I'm joined by the rest of my co-hosts, Dean, Nick, and David. Hi. Today we're going to be taking oh. a look at uh, <laughs> Dean saying hi. <laughs> it's the best no, we all get to say hi. hello. Hello there. Not anymore, Dean. <laughs> I was on a roll. We actually don't speak. We're just here to listen, and Tim tells us what our choices are. <laughs> Tim just does everything in one breath. He doesn't breathe. He's still not breathing. You have to learn how to speak on the, the down breaths. Tim's already decided that all of our, our uh, favorite cameos are wrong. He's like, no, it's Bill Murray and pick a movie. <laughs> <laughs> on all of them. <laughs> uh, so, yeah. So, actually, our topic this week is going to be our cameos that we enjoy. Uh, there are not a lack of choices to pick from. <laughs> and That's somehow sure. I still found this difficult. It's also, just point at a Marvel movie. <laughs> also, I feel like. I was just researching of like cameos and things. I'm looking at lists. I'm looking at stuff just to kind of jog my memory. And I think it is very argued or unless it's just not well known on what exactly constitutes a cameo. Um, because I think it's a feeling listed as a cameo. Yeah. But like people have things listed as a cameo. That's like Tom Cruise and Tropic Thunder. Yeah. It's he's like, He's throughout the movie. Is it a, not cameo a cameo if he's in no. 20 minutes of the film no. and he's a character with like a ton of lines? Yeah, and he appears multiple times. like at that point, you're, you're not a cameo. No. It's a role. Right. Yeah. I just had this conversation before we got on with my wife and she was like, oh yeah, you know, my favorite cameo is Jamie Lee Curtis in The Bear. And I'm like, well, I mean, yeah, but she was a character in the episode. But I'm like, it's only one episode and it was kind of short. And I'm like, I don't know. That is the most nerve wracking episode of TV I've watched that year. Though. Oh, yeah. Oh, I never. I People still are like, it's the best episode show. of the season. And I'm sitting there and I'm just like, I am having heart palpitations just because I'm getting anxiety from watching this of just like a family dinner going horribly, horribly wrong as the farther it goes on. Uh, but that will save for our favorite character arcs or single episodes yeah that's or... that's dumb because i i still don't have a choice and i'm reluctant to admit that i think i'm gonna go oh almost... you're in the dean position I am. oh it means you have to go first or at least we'll tease you for 20 minutes <laughs> about going first so i i googled of course top cameos in the very first one from movieweb.com number four lists christopher walken in pulp fiction like how the hell is that a cameo that one's tough because it's like it literally is one scene it is a very short yeah it's like a five minute it's like a five minute monologue but that i mean that's it yeah but still i mean it the whole concept of i think a cameo is either you blink and you miss them but you know for a fact that person is in it and it's not a central character or talking point through the entire movie they just happen to be in it very briefly and they don't technically belong in it yeah, like when I think of a cameo, I think of maybe like, uh, I mean, the, the obvious one is Bill Murray in Zombieland or like Jeremy Piven in Rush Hour 2 kind of deal where it's like you are in one scene and that's it. And it goes against their typical norm, if anything, too. Which I, I guess technically that means the Christopher Walken scene in Pulp Fiction is a cameo. Mm -hmm. Although I just find it weird having it as like a character who plays an integral part to the story. Um, being considered a cameo. Go ahead, Dean. What? <laughs> All right. I'll, am I starting? I'll start. I know you mentioned um, Bill Murray in Zombieland. I have to say that's probably like it was my the most pick. surprising. Bill Murray. <laughs> that, I have to say that that is my pick. <laughs> it was. It was the most. It was the first. It's the first thing I think when it's like favorite cameo. I think just because it was so surprising. And that one, I feel like he's. It's a good. He's in it for a little bit. Like. It's really not much. It's not a lot, but it, yeah, they like a, they like talk about it like briefly scenes. before it. I wouldn't say it's not a cameo, but I think it borders on. He's in well, it I also for, think for like a couple. I also think for a couple minutes because he plays himself in it. It's like extra cameo. -y. Yeah, I, I, I would say I'm not going to say it's not a cameo, but it, it definitely was the most surprising, and it has the funniest ending I think they could have come up with to his. <laughs> 
roll. <laughs> Do you have any regrets? Garfield, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> um, but in my short list, oh, I'm going to go with Wayne's World 2. Wayne pulls into a gas station on his way to stop Cassandra's <laughs> wedding. And he's talking to the gas station attendant. And then complains that the actor is not weighty enough and doing a good job. So they bring in Charlton Heston. And he plays the gas station attendant and uh, makes Wayne cry. Wow, I did not remember that. That is a terrific scene. (laughs) Ah, Gordon Street. Do we have to put up with this? I mean, you know, can't we get a better actor? I know it's a small part, but I think we can do better than this. Gordon Street. Oh, yes. Gordon Street. I once knew a girl who lived on Gordon Street a long time ago when I was a young man. Not a day passes I don't think of her and the promise I made, which I will always keep, that one perfect day on Gordon Street. That's uh, five blocks up, two over. I thought originally you were going to go with, what's his name, like Ed O'Neill in the diner. Why do they go to me to die? Why do they come to me to die? <laughs> those movies are just, those movies are great. Great movies. But yeah, that Charlton Heston cameo is, is pretty great. It's just a very non sequitur, zany, meta moment. But yeah, it's just pretty well done. He just, <laughs> the guest, the attendant like starts, he's like, oh, like turn on Gordon Street. And he's like, oh, I used to know a girl on Gordon Street and reflects just had this moment and then like Charlton Heston brings this fake but also very good gravitas to the scene. <laughs> and like Wayne, Wayne's crying by the end of it. Yeah, it's a you, I'll throw it on in the in the link so you can watch it on Discord. Which I feel like is a gag that will probably not be recognizable within the next ten years by the next generation of like, who is this guy? Right. How is he any different from the last guy? <laughs> yeah. That's Charlton Heston. He was very big for a while. He <laughs> loves guns. It's one of the A-listers. I know. It's, it is it is kind of a funny cameo because as time goes on, he becomes less and less known. And like even when that kind of came out, he wasn't that well known. He was like, oh, yeah, Charlton, H- Char- uh, Charlton Heston. Like, oh, yeah, he did stuff. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it, yeah, even at that point, I think a lot of it was more the people that are watching Wayne's World probably like the the older the Gen X crowd or something grew up on seeing him introduced by probably their parents and like whoever in the millennial age grew up watching him during their parents but for the most part it wasn't like you flip on a TV and you just see like 10 new Charlton Heston movies at that point <laughs> why not I, mean, I think yes. the only thing around that time is he did uh, In the Mouth of Madness John Carpenter um us six-year-olds are were lining up for that movie. <laughs> I remember even as a kid, what like cool. I I didn't know who Charlton Heston was really, but the scene was still very funny to me because they just shuffled this guy. Like the set PA comes in and like moves this guy off the screen. <laughs> He's like, "What's going on?" <laughs> and they bring in Charlton Heston, Cheston, Cheston. Yeah, it's a funny little cameo, a true cameo. It's all of 30 seconds and he's gone. I think that's a good pick, Dean. Thanks, bro. Thank you for opening the show. I want to watch Wayne's Bravery. World now. It's all, Go it's, first. They're also really good. Pick it next month. Okay. And the, the trouble is, like, which one? The first or second one? It's kind of... <laughs> I think the first edges out the second one, but they're both pretty good. Pick the inevitable legacy sequel that'll come out in four years <laughs> when they decide to just drop it, just be like the Wayne's World. Hey, if it's as good as personally what I th- think of Bill and Ted Face the Music, I actually enjoyed that movie quite a oh. bit. If it's at least that good, I'll I'll be happy. Man, I forgot that one. It's worth your time if you if you enjoyed the first two movies. Hmm. I completely forgot that they brought that back. I should probably watch that because I love the first two movies. Yeah, I it's that good. Was like early COVID. Yeah, it's worth your time. It's kind of like slipped under. And I think one of the daughters is Samara Weaving, or like the daughter's friend or something. Sure. I guess. 
Dean's the only one who saw it, so. <laughs> oh, no, I saw it, too. Dean, just... don't you remember? <laughs> I just definitely don't it's remember. It's been a while. It came out in 2021 or 2020, I think. It was during the dark times. Yeah. That's my gap year. <laughs> watch it, listener. It's good. Yeah. Am I included in that, or can I not watch it? You no, can watch no, it. <laughs> Everyone had... but David. <laughs> I had Bill and Ted shortlisted for my can't, uh, duos pick, but yeah, I didn't go with them. That also was going to be on my duos list. <laughs> it's, it's a pretty good one. Excellent. So depending on if duos gets released first, oh, um, add that onto their <laughs> listeners. Um, if duos comes out second, spoilers. <laughs> spoilers <laughs> for what I didn't pick. There's, I mean, there's not that many duos, so like really like pares it down quite a bit. <laughs> right. <laughs> no, man, it's not Bill and Ted. So I was like, who is it? Brady and Gronk. Mordecai and Rigby from regular show. Mm, that is good. So speaking of good, I actually have three choices, and I don't know which one. I'm going to let you choose. Pick one, two, or three, and that's going to be uh, your choice. Let's go with three. Three. Feel All lucky. Right. All right, that is, and then that's the one. All right, so that is going to be John Hurt in Spaceballs. I almost said that one. I'm yep. really happy. My, my second choices are being picked. This is a great day. Yeah, so I, I don't know if I had seen Alien or was really big into Alien by this point in time, but this was one of the most memed things even afterward because of just how shocking the chestburster scene was. So at the end of Spaceballs, when <laughs> the whole adventure is over and Lone Star and Barf go into the diner to, you know, finally relax and celebrate. Like, hey, we got the money. We don't have to deal with Pizza the Hut. They order their food. And then John Hurt is there with a crew of other space truckers, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> and then the the chest burster scene thing happens again and he looks down at his chest and he's just like oh no not again <laughs> and it's the same actor that dealt with the chest burster and alien i would never really put two and two together like oh you know this is from alien it's just you know, oh it's that scene okay but the fact that they so got you, the original that was actor from space balls <laughs> so if you saw Alien second, you're like, oh, it's the guy from Spaceballs. Oh God. <laughs> yep. Now with six more gallons of blood. So it was kind of a not as much of a shock going into it, because that but that by that point, that's one of the big spoilers that would have there's no way you could have avoided it by that point in time. I um I I just want to interject with a quick kind of funny story. I had a, a reverse cameo moment with Spaceballs. Oh, so you already know about the chestburster. You're familiar with him. <laughs> and then uh, when he came out of John Hurt, like, oh, that's where you came from. Um, no, mine was mine was kind of smaller. So in the scene where they're combing the desert. Yeah. Uh, and then they have the, the two guys like, oh, we ain't found shit. Mm -hmm. um, I had a reverse cameo because I was a big fan of Star Trek Voyager. And one of the guy, the guy who actually says that line is uh, Tim Russ, who plays Tuvok, the Vulcan, on Star Trek Voyager. And I had watched Voyager and then sat down and watched Spaceballs. And I was like, wait a second. <laughs> oh, that's cool. <laughs> I never knew that. Both stories, him and, and you. I thought a reverse cameo was somebody that doesn't appear in the movie. <laughs> yeah, I, was, I wasn't sure what you meant by that. <laughs> he doesn't show up for a little bit in the middle. Well, no, because he has he he has a tiny part before he becomes any like any. Famous. Oh, I see. Yes, I see. <laughs> well, I guess that's like what um, you call a career. Like um, <laughs> <laughs> what's her name in Hook? <laughs> it's crazy how everybody just cameos until they really make it big. <laughs> Well, to me, it felt like it was a cameo, even though technically it wasn't. It was just, you know, how working works. <laughs> Man, you just keep showing up at your job long enough and you're uh, you're a regular. Water my ass. Get this dude some Pepto-Bismol. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my other two choices was going to be um, oh, it's not Matt allowed. Damon. Can't say this. Oh, oh, okay. All right. Dean, what is your what is your uh no? Yes, Dean, what is your choice? I'm just I'm just fucking with you. Well, I don't also want to say my Wait. oh that's I'll true. Yeah, you shouldn't backups. do runners up until everybody at least has said yeah. something. Yeah, because I don't want to steal your. Well, now I don't know if you're gonna go Matt thunder. Damon one movie or Matt Damon in the other movie or Matt Damon in like Saturday Night Live. He's got several cameras. as Loki. 
actually, yeah, Matt Damon is like the king of cameos. We can do a rule of thirds on what movie from Matt Damon that he was rescued in is your top movie. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. What is up with that? People rescuing Matt Damon. A lot, yeah. Maybe that's like his thing. Like Tom Cruise likes to run really fast in movies and Matt Damon likes to be rescued. He likes Two to be in, them in space. And How about them apples? Well, I can go. Speaking of Matt Damon. Oh, is yours Matt Damon? <laughs> yes, it is. <laughs> Uh, so speaking of Matt Damon, uh, my favorite cameo is um, drumroll Matt Damon in a, a, a I want to say small movie. I don't think it had much success, but a 2004 kind of pseudo coming of age movie that came out the perfect time for my high school to college slash older life transition. A movie called Euro Trip. Hey, listen up, everybody. Got a little special thing I'd like to do tonight and play a little song for you about the nastiest, freakiest little sex puppet I know, Fiona. This one's for you, baby. Happy anniversary. That which was is, my second choice. Which is kind of <laughs> uh, like a trashy stoner comedy that I don't think did great, but like it hit me. Well, I mean, I think I saw it with you, Nick. Yeah. Uh, but like hit us at like a, a perfect point where like we were we were at that age. And Matt Damon cameos as just the an asshole uh, <laughs> who steals one like one of the main character's girlfriend and is having like a secret not affair because they're not married, but like, you know, I guess affair, like with this guy's girlfriend. And is at a huge party, and he has a song about it. That is, <laughs> it's just a banger. The lead it just singer kills. Of the band. It is just such a good song. I love how through the whole movie too, the song keeps coming up. Scotty doesn't know that Fiona and me do it in my van every Sunday. She tells him she's in church, but she doesn't go. Still, she's on her knees, and Scotty doesn't know. Oh, Scotty doesn't know. Well. Yeah, it's so catchy and it's a great song. And like, I remember when the movie came out, like, I downloaded, like, I mean, at the time it was probably off Napster uh, and like would listen to it all the time because it was so good. But yeah, like, he's got like a shaved head and he's all tattooed and piercings and he's just like this asshole who leads a band singing this song. And it just like timed out well for him because he, he did it because the Euro trip was written by a college friend of his and the friend asked him like, Hey, will you be in this? And Matt Damon at the time he was, was like, Can filming. I bring that? Yeah. He, at, the, <laughs> <laughs> at the time he was filming brothers Grimm and he had, he was wearing a what? wig for, yeah, he was wearing a wig for it. So like when they asked him like, Oh, Hey, would you shave your head for this cameo? He was like, yeah, sure. It doesn't matter. Like I'm wearing a wig. The makeup team will be thrilled. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. It's like forty minutes of no makeup chair that I have to deal with. Yeah. So he was just like, Yeah, like totally just do it. Yeah, the screenwriter for your trip was a, a good friend of his. Uh and actually the person who wrote the song uh was like a friend's brother. So like the band he just did it because like some friends wanted him to do it. Well, I have to double check that maybe. I think I think it is. Scotty doesn't yeah. know about Lustra. I don't put two and two like it doesn't make sense to me that Euro Trip and Brothers Grimm happened at the same time because for some reason I thought Brothers Grimm was later. 2004, it was just a weird time, I guess. Yeah, it was just like a really weird unexpected cameo where you're like you watch it and like he's he's hard to recognize, honestly, because like he, he does, he has like the, the neck tattoo and like so many change things and it's like, what? But There were a bunch of cameos in the movie because wasn't Lucy Lawless like the dominatrix or something like that? Yeah. Damn, I haven't seen that movie since it came out. You know, when it came out, too, I had a soft spot for Road Trip, and I liked that so much better. But the more and more and more I kept watching Euro Trip, the more I was just like, man, this is way better of a, mm. the exact same kind of movie. Are they not affiliated in any way? Mm-hmm. There was a period of those movies where it was just kind of like this kind of weird uh, transitional, like, semi-raunchy comedies. Yep. I, uh... For listeners, I'm a drummer, um, and I play not in a band, I guess, but was just with guys locally, and we 100 percent 
have Scotty Does Know on our set list. So, <laughs> <laughs> no, it's a, not joking. It's a it, whatever the hell the young kids call it. I it's it's an awesome song. Hey, Bob. I hate that a expression bop. with a fucking passion. It slays yes, that one. It slays. I like that one. Yeah. <laughs> It slays. It's giving. I wish I, was, I wish I was cool enough to say slays. I like it so much. Scotty doesn't know has riz. You can cut <laughs> dripping that with it. Cut that up. Yeah, yeah. Cut cut you are all up. too old for any of this. <laughs> so are you. <laughs> but at least I'm aware. <laughs> so Tim, you're gonna round it out for us. I didn't have a pick. So my cameo that came to mind was a couple of them. The one I'm gonna go with tonight is in an episode of Mork and Mindy, the old sitcom, there is an episode where everybody says that Mork looks exactly like Robin Williams. (laughs) And then Robin Williams comes to town to do a stand-up special. And the whole episode is people following Mork around and him having to deal with like being mistaken for Robin Williams while Mindy tries to get an interview with him for her job. And at the very end of the episode, we actually get like a dual Robin Williams situation of them interviewing Robin Williams as Mork interacts with Robin Williams in the room. So he gets a cameo on his own show as himself in one scene briefly. That's um, funny. It, it was very interesting for its time of kind of what it did with that. But I think the thing that's interesting is the conversation, like the interview that she gives to him is so very different from the manic character that he's doing as Mork, because then it's more of the the real him playing himself of explaining like, well, you're mobbed by people. Why do you do it? Well, I do it because I feel like if I don't do it, I let people down and it's tough to say no, because if once you say no, then people start treating you differently because you're you forgot what it's like to be one of the small people once you start turning people down. And- but then after the lecture, you performed until 3 a.m. at the comedy cabaret. And now you're doing two shows tonight. Well, uh, two reasons. See, I'm a performing addict. I can't get enough of it. And also, the owner of the comedy cabaret is a friend of a cousin of a friend of a friend of a so and so. Well, I couldn't say no. Gee, that's a great angle for my story. Robin Williams, the comedian who can't say no. And it was like, him bearing his soul on an episode of his own sitcom through the guise of him just playing himself as a character, which was kind of tough because then she's like, well, wouldn't you have so much more time to yourself to just like be yourself and think about your own things? But it seems to me you can't say no to a total stranger. All right. It also looks like you're probably taking advantage of a lot. You know, if you learn to say no, you'd probably have a lot more time to yourself. Uh, maybe that's the last thing I want. But I thought it was, it's a very fun scene. And I think it's always great to see Robin Williams back on a screen. So that kind of, kind of sort of cameo, because he's only in one scene towards the, the end of this. But I think it makes a, an impact on the whole process. Sounds kind of heavy. It is. Yeah. Is it played heavy? The way you're describing it sounds like, oh, man. I mean, they still, like, they lighten it up by, like, some dumb little mork humor here and there for the most part. But, like, they do play it, not seriously, it's not supposed to be, like, sad, but it is supposed to be kind of, like, somber or melancholy of, like, yeah, it's tough. Yeah, like, I, I would like to relax. I would like to stop. But I don't, I worry about what it would happen if I did stop. And I would worry about the people I let down and like the people's lives I touch by doing what I do. So it's like, yeah, it's still wacky sitcom stuff, but it is very kind of serious with all of that, um, which is why I think it ended up being memorable. I've never watched the show, but if I were to watch any one specifically from Mork and Mindy, I think that would be it. Yeah. Yeah. I, I would catch episodes here and then like back when Nick at Night played them. But it's interesting because like sitcoms of that era had somber stuff. Like I remember like um, watching Taxi and like Taxi had some really somber episodes too where they'd like get into real stuff. Or like the episode of MASH with, uh, was it the chicken or something? And then you find out like, oh, he killed the chicken. And at the end of the episode, it's like, no, his brain convinced him he killed the chicken. It was actually a baby during the war or something like that. 
It's like, oh, and this is a comedy sitcom. <laughs> yeah. I never took it as one, considering just the intro always made it seem like it was kind of a somber show to begin with. Well, the opening theme song is called, was it Suicide is Painless? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I think MASH was always very firmly planted in comedy drama with like the it's comedic but it's not necessarily like a laugh out loud comedy it's people making jokes and humor to get through the fact that they are at war which i think is why it ended up lasting in the cultural zeitgeist uh, longer than what it would have it was just like a yuck 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 comedy show well it was a well-written show too I haven't heard anyone yeah. ever say something negative about MASH. Uh, anybody who wanted that time slot. Well, yeah, but I mean, you can say the same thing about <laughs> today with anything. What do you mean, Nick? There are no time slots anymore. Streaming. On demand. <laughs> Entertainment is everything. All at once. Netflix yelling at me. It's like, no, you can't watch this at 8 p.m. What are you doing? You have to watch this other show. It's like, no, I'm going to watch Cupcake and Dino for the 17th time. <laughs> yeah, I mean, having... There's another cartoon, only got two seasons. <laughs> everything available all the time so often that it becomes this fun novelty. When I have, uh, like, the Shutter streaming service and their big thing is like, oh, we have Shutter TV, where it's like three different channels and it's just always playing a movie. It's like, oh, the novelty of I don't select it. I just turn it on and catch it wherever it is. Like this old TV thing. I mean, that's that's what I do with uh, right now the uh, Mystery Science Theater three thousand Forever Stream or Forever a Thon. It's it, they started it. They did a uh, New Year's countdown where they're like, we're gonna do like a week of just twenty four hour streaming like Mystery Science Theater. And I was like, oh, awesome. And then New Year's came and it was still on. And then the day after New Year's and it was still on. And then two days after new year's and then they just retitled the the, the stream to the forever that's a good idea though <laughs> so just, now i'll just like now i'll just go to it and be like i wonder which one's on <laughs> huh yeah so that's my pick that's all of our picks any final thoughts on cameos uh, before we drop this thing into the ground my last choice would have been um toby mcguire in the Satan's Alley trailer in the beginning of Tropic Thunder. <laughs> I, I had one that I thought was a little too niche, which was Drake Bell doing a cameo on iCarly. Too niche. Which they did like a funny crossover thing. I had another one I was going to mention, uh, but it's not really a cameo because it was more of a blooper of, what was I think it was Family Matters. And during a scene in Family Matters, oh, yeah, yeah. Um, Uncle Phil... Oh walks in from like the other set or something and he just like comes in the front door and starts talking and then he looks around like wait a second <laughs> and it's like okay That's... sure so he's on the show but it's not really like part of the episode it's just like the fun little end of the episode thing they used to do mm, that that was the same that's how my iCarly one went well, it was just like wait i'm not on this show it's like what well oh, no. one of those careers aged better than the other <laughs> Oh, and then I lied. The um, and then lastly was um, Dan Aykroyd in Casper, the friendly ghost movie, playing Ray Stans, or yeah, from Which Ghostbusters. Which is wild because I don't, I don't remember <laughs> that at all. Not us. I don't remember. He's that a either. two second yeah. thing. The the girl's trying to exercise the place of ghosts, and she gets like one of the guy. I don't know his name. He was a regular on SNL, and it was like one of his SNL personalities. But he plays a priest. He goes in. It oh, Father work. Guido Sarducci. Yeah, and then the very next one, you see the like a bunch of stuff getting thrown out the front door. The ghost laughing, and then you see um, Dean Aykroyd running down the sk- stairs in full Ghostbusters get up, and he's like, "Who are you gonna call? Somebody else." And then he just books it from the uh, off camera. What if instead of he comes running, it's just the stuff flies out, and then his corpse just goes right through the door and hits the <laughs> ground? What's <laughs> a different like, oh, so bookend on right. Ghostbusters? <laughs> Uh, I, I would still count this as a cameo, even though this person is from the universe, but, and it was also combined with the best use of your single fuck allowed in a PG-13 movie, but it would be oh, X-Men yeah. first class when, uh, they go to try to talk to Logan and he just tells them to go fuck themselves and that's, that's all you see of him. That, that got me laughing pretty, 
pretty good. I think the whole audience pretty much erupted in laughter when that happened. That was well done. That I was like very that. well done. First Class was such a good start to a new trilogy that did not hit all the notes I was hoping for the other two movies. I love Days of Future Past. I hate how much they leaned into Mystique of like, okay, so we got Jennifer Lawrence, so that means we need to rewrite this entire thing, that Mystique is now <laughs> the founding member of the X-Men. She's the <laughs> most important person. She's everything hinges on her. Unless the next Hunter Games do this poorly, in which case we get rid of her and we bring in Sophie Turner for the next film. <laughs> yeah, I didn't so. see... I didn't see Apocalypse or I guess the is the fourth one technically right or no? Um, because Days of Future, yeah, third was Apocalypse the one with Apocalypse, and then the fourth was Dark Phoenix. Yeah, I didn't. I only saw. I love Days of Future Past, and I didn't see the other two. I still haven't seen Dark Phoenix. I just feel like the Femke Jensen one was good enough, and I didn't need another rehash of the same story it's, with a yeah. It's cast. just a rehash. Yeah. Also, it wasn't good enough. I, which is disappointing because I liked the cast that they brought in for a lot of the characters. Like I did like, um, was it Dave Ty Sheridan as like a young Scott Summers and all of that? But eh, we'll get on the next go around. <laughs> when Daniel Radcliffe comes as Logan, we'll <laughs> try again. <laughs> oh boy the internet is on fire with the hopes i don't understand which i don't understand like i love daniel radcliffe but there's something about him that does not scream logan to me even though he you can be as ripped as you want to be but you're you're not logan yeah there's there is a a singular scene in miracle miracle workers a show that he's in that where he rips his shirt off and he's super jacked and his hair just happens to be just right where he kind of looks like logan and everyone just went nuts being like oh my god he'd be so good just because of this one still (laughs) image of him (laughs) it's like i mean besides the fact that like yeah he kind of looks good in the scene for a wolverine like he that's not that's not him like his his acting persona is not that like there's no there's no movie he's been in where i was just like oh he could totally pull off wolverine we're like yeah like like, no i mean i i i have developed a love for daniel radcliffe despite not liking harry potter much at all <laughs> which is which I, I i always find really funny have you seen guns again because like i've just yes okay good i've i've just fallen in love with daniel radcliffe's like his his i don't, I don't even know what to call it but like his attraction to just doing the weirdest stuff he can find did you see weird <gasps> i still need to see that i don't know if i yeah know you that. need to see it it's good. It's the Weird Al. It's the Weird Al um, movie. You don't even have to like Weird Al. Oh, all right. Yeah, he he was fantastic in it. I am not a Weird Al fan. I don't listen to anything, and the only song I know of his is, um, the episode one parody with the American Pie. That's it. But he was fantastic in that movie. Yeah, he's he like Daniel Radcliffe does great stuff, and he just like the wackiest stuff. Well, he probably that, made like all the wackiest his roles from Harry Potter. So now it's like. I'm set financially. Mm-hmm. I can just have fun and just choose stuff. Like, yeah, can be and, I, and, I lo- and I love it. Like when, when I saw that he was doing the miracle workers show, like I was just like all in and um, I haven't finished the third season, but like the first two seasons were so, so funny. If he does get cast as Wolverine, um, that'll be fine because we need a, it'll, it'll be a weird X-Men. We need a smaller, hairier Wolverine, like in the comics. I think it's just because Hugh Jackman is just so fun and so great that everybody's like, well, I can't imagine anybody else other than Hugh Jackman. You know, the 5'4 Wolverine who's like built like a brick shit house compared to like 6'5 Hugh Jackman. Like Bob Hoskins would have been a better Wolverine <laughs> in terms of just like matching the comic book. Let's we'll say you're Danny DeVito. I mean, that's true. And also, I think it's it's. I, I think when he's playing Wolverine, it's called his name is Huge Jackman. <laughs> Huge Jacked Man. It would be really, it <laughs> would be Jack really Man. interesting if they actually went with the short, stockiest shit Wolverine. That will never happen, but um, I mean they should. It'd be really I, interesting. <laughs> Old man Logan with Danny DeVito, <laughs> <laughs> and they do the uh, uh, what was it? There was an, an old, a very old cartoon, uh, one of the old X Men cartoons where Wolverine also had a Scottish accent. It was great. Welcome, her white. She's not joining the X-Men, is she? She's just a kid. 
Wolverine, can't you see the girl is scared? Oh, I wonder if that was the Kitty Pride and the X Men, where it was like the precursor to the '90s X Men. Yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. Why not? He's Canadian, but why not? See you later. <laughs> I was like, this is a weird pick. Good night. See ya. So uh, on that note, I guess Dean's gonna just close this up. <laughs> and that concludes our episode. Just very, just very monosyllabic. <laughs> Uh, remember, you can reach us on all the big social media sites at Screen Refresh or email us at screenrefresh at gmail.com so we can hear what your top three choices would be or any other topics you want to hear us talk about. Also, we have a Discord. It keeps forgetting to update the invite link, and it's absolutely now working 100%. We're all extremely active on there and love to talk our favorite movies, games, and whatever else that may come to mind. So for David, Nick, and Dean, this is Tim. Take care of yourself and you can catch us next on Screen Refresh airing every first Monday of the month or also on our sister podcast with me on Don't Open This Podcast hosted by me and Mike Felsigno every second and fourth Monday of the month. So, so long. Oh, I actually have another cameo and that's going to be Dean and myself on Don't Open This Podcast. That's your favorite. What, yeah, that, what, what what what's what's the topic? The summer, the slasher. Uh, no, no, he's saying like when we appear. The summer affair? Yeah. That it was that that thing that we did. I had a talking. Oh, a, the one that already we, came. We were cops. Yeah. Well, one of you were. <laughs> we're cops. Uh, who was I? <laughs> Let's be play? cops. Uh, I was. The, you were was the, I the, cop? the actual. You were the actual cop. Yeah. yeah. Does Venmo count as a social media network? Because come find us on Venmo. Yeah, please find us on Venmo. <laughs> yeah, we can leave descriptions and comments and likes. Yeah, post to us all the time on Venmo. I should make us a coffee. I, I can go for a coffee, Nick. Do you want to make me a coffee? If you excuse me, guys, I've got to go make my wife a grilled ham and cheese sandwich. Okay. Uh, so I guess that's how we end the episode. And good night. <laughs>